Apologetic text, he says to come over. Well, the whole damn town has been waiting for the day when you would come back here. Back here. There was dancing and talking and steaks on the grill, and I think that I will be all right. And my ex from high school still looks just the same as she did back in 2009. I couldn't wait till the morning. Let's never put the night on night. Never put the night on ice Oh, I wanna sit right here, right here Chilling with my friends for another year I would walk away from the spotlight For the good life Oh, come on, turn your hate into poetry Pain into power And at least the friends and your minutes into hours I would walk away from the spotlight For the good life, for the good life And they all said I Track of the forest through the trees, forgot what I was chasing. Spent so many nights living out at sea that my heart is gone vacant. And everybody who was close to me all stayed on dry land. So now I'm driving back on Interstate West. I just gotta feel something. Not gonna wait till the morning because something's gonna change my mind. I don't want to change my mind Oh, I want to stay right here, right here Chilling with my friends for another year I would walk away from the spotlight For the good life oh, Come on, turn your hate into poetry Pain into power And I need some friends and your minutes into hours I would walk away from the spotlight For the good life For the good life my best friend an apologetic text he says to come over well the whole damn town has been waiting for the day when you would come back here, back here. there was dancing and talking and steaks on the grill and i think that i will be all right and my ex from high school still looks just the same as she did back in 2009 i couldn't wait till the morning let's never put the night on night Never put the night on ice Oh, I wanna sit right here, right here Chilling with my friends for another year I would walk away from the spotlight For the good life oh, Come on, turn your hate into poetry Pain into power And I need some friends and your minutes into hours I would walk away from the spotlight For the good life, for the good life And they all said I Good evening. Welcome to the Looking Ahead Lecture Series number four. My name is Nathan Towney. I'm the Pro Vice-Chancellor Indigenous Strategy and Leadership at the University of Newcastle 
and it gives me great privilege tonight to introduce Auntie Laurel Williams, uh, the chairperson of our Nurikai Consultancy Committee, who will be delivering the acknowledgement of country. Thanks, Aunt. Thank you, Nathan. Kai Yandi Nudawa. Hello, everyone. I am Laurel Williams, a Biripai woman. I acknowledge today that we all stand on a Wabical land. In traditional Aboriginal countries, there are spaces set aside for a variety of community activities. Various aspects of cultural education takes place everywhere throughout the environment. In all research activities associated with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander research, there are four principles that need to be considered. They are self-determination, establishing rapport with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities through trust and respect is vital for successful research outcomes. Leadership, identifying the appropriate knowledge holders within Aboriginal communities is a challenge for both Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal researchers. Impact and value. Research activities must be beneficial to Aboriginal communities determined by informed consent, not assumption. Sustainability and accountability. The cultural connection to country is forever ongoing. Ethical considerations in an Aboriginal cultural context needs to underpin any scientific and social research protocols. A Wabical country is bounded by Dagenyang to the south, Wanarua to the west and Waramai in the north. The seascape which cradles the Wabical lands are the waters of the Pacific Ocean, Lake Macquarie and the Hunter River. Enjoy this beautiful landscape while ever you are on this country. Nunda Kumba Kumba, thank you. Uh, good evening, colleagues. Uh, my name's Paul Jeans, and I have the honour of being both the Chancellor of the University of Newcastle and also Chair of the Royal Society's Hunter Branch. And I'll talk a little more about that in a moment. But before doing so, can I thank both you, Nathan, and you, Artie Laurel, for your welcome to country. Uh, can I also uh, personally acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which our Callaghan campus is located, the Pambalong clan of the Awabakal people, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Tonight is uh, uh, a very interesting occasion. And if I can talk about it just for a moment from the perspective of the Royal Society. Uh, the Royal Society is in its first operational year in the Hunter Valley. The Royal Society itself is the oldest learning society, learned society in Australia. And uh, next year will celebrate its bicentenary. Uh, it's significant that the Hunter branch is the first branch of the uh, Royal Society to be formed outside of Sydney, apart from a small branch in the Southern Highlands. And uh, our branch has started off this year with a great deal of enthusiasm. Uh, and part of that enthusiasm is to conduct a series of public lectures. Some of those lectures will be co-badged with the University of Newcastle. And tonight's lecture is one such lecture. It's the fourth lecture from the Royal Society's perspective this year, and it's co badged with the University of Newcastle's Looking Ahead series, which is a series uh, from the perspective of both organisations that are conducted into topics of, of really interest, both interest and importance to the Hunter Valley as it looks forward to the future. So this is a, a, a very exciting night. Uh, tonight's speaker is Professor Janet Nelson, who is Deputy Vice-Chancellor and Vice-President of Research and Innovation at the University of Newcastle. In this role, she serves as the University's Chief Research Officer 
uh, with responsibilities for the diverse and comprehensive research enterprise. Professor Nelson came from the University of Idaho uh, earlier this year, uh, a position at the university she held a position of vice which in economic development. Prior to that, uh, Professor Nelson was the associate vice chancellor uh, and research development at the University of Tennessee. She has a keen focus on building and supporting multidisciplinary teams and growing the research enterprise. Professor Nelson has over 30 years of experience in scientific research, scientific review, and research portfolio administration, complex and multidisciplinary project management, business development, and science policy implementation. She's demonstrated leader with uh, experience across not-for-profit uh, organisations and industry. She has a keen focus on building, supporting multidisciplinary teams and growing research enterprise. Uh, I just like to mention a key aspect of Janet's career to date, uh, and that's been around her opening up of university research and administration to welcome and facilitate industry partnerships. Uh, her background uh, includes her role as Director of Business Development at URS Corporation in the United States, now AECOM, Director of Biotechnology Innovation Organization in Washington, D.C. And these roles have given her a, an excellent perspective, not only from within academia, but from without. So she's seen it from industry's perspective, which is a great advantage for uh, uh, for us in the Hunter. Professor Nelson's also worked very closely with the University of Newcastle's Vice Chancellor uh, to help to establish the Hunter Hydrogen Task Force to accelerate our region's tr transition to new methods of energy production and storage. So uh, Janet's background is extremely relevant uh, to the Hunter's future. And tonight with a panel of uh, interested parties she is both going to present and then hold a panel discussion. And then finally, uh, you're invited to pose questions uh, during the lecture uh, through the uh, mechanisms of this uh, 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 engaged in. Uh, and, and Natalie uh, Thamwatana will collate these questions for reflecting back to Janet at the end of the presentation. So if you'd like to uh, keep those questions coming, they'll be collated and represented at the end of the presentation. So Janet, can I invite you to uh, make your presentation and engage with your panel? And I'm sure we're all looking forward to a, a very interesting evening. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Chancellor, for, for that very warm introduction. And thank you to Auntie Laurel for that wonderful welcome to country. Um, I, I need to tell you here in the audience, in person and at home, that I met Auntie Laurel a few months ago. She welcomed me into her home, and she's welcomed me to this country. And hearing about her culture and experience as a local Aboriginal woman really touched me. And I, I asked her if she would do this, um, this opening tonight. And I can't imagine that it could have been better said. So thank you very much, Auntie. Um, I'm really honored to be here. Um, I'd like to echo the sentiment of the Chancellor about how wonderful it is that we're able to co and jointly present this lecture this evening with the Royal Society of the New South Wales. Uh, I don't know how much you know about the Royal Society, but their logo is here on the screen. And the little tiny words in the bottom, if you translate them, say, question everything. And I think that, re that reflects a lot of my life and the way I've approached research and the way I continue to approach research administration. As most of you know, I'm here new to this country, but I'm not new to the position. I'm in this position because I really love facilitating and enabling research, scholarship, and creative activity 
I have a passion for helping enable our researchers and scholars to do this, to do this in an engaged way, in an interdisciplinary way, in a way that really involves multiple stakeholders. And thus, I've really chosen the title today, The Engaged University, based on a number of activities that I've been involved in over the last several decades in the United States and that I was attracted to from this position here when I came to the Hunter and that I am so happy to be continuing to help guide. Tonight we're going to be talking a bit about our strategic plan, the looking ahead 2020 to 2025. We'll talk a little bit about our engaged living laboratory model. And I don't have time tonight to talk about all the wonderful research, scholarship, and creative activities that are ongoing here at the Hunter, but I'm going to use the opportunity with hydrogen to illustrate some of the connection between our strategic plan and some of our important partnerships. And I hope you'll see that with the guests that I've selected. So I'm really excited to be here today. So um, many of you have been uh, participating in our lecture series, and I hope most of you know that here at the University of Newcastle, we announced a strategic plan, a brand new strategic plan. It was actually announced on my very first day of the position, uh, about two days after the COVID shutdown. So you can imagine starting a lot of things <laughs> at the same time. But this is a really important topic to me. It really, um, we're going to explore a premise about many parts of this strategic plan today about this engaged research, the excellence in the engaged research. But I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit high level that our strategic plan is really important, that we really have a passion for the student experience and for serving our communities. You'll see that at the very center of the strategic plan diagram here in the middle of, of the screen surrounded by the words that Nathan and Auntie Loyal reminded us about, about our commitment to the indigenous um, higher education and sustainability. And what we would really like to be, I think, sums it up in the words you've probably heard, we want to be a world leading university for our region. So we have values of excellence, of equity, of engagement and sustainability. And today we're going to talk a lot more about our engagement priorities. I was really happy as I was reflecting on what I might say tonight to, to read a statement that came out last week from the Minister for Education. And it's like, this is great. He's really encouraging collaborations between universities and businesses. And I thought, we're already doing this. It's like he read our minds and we're right there and we're ready. This is an important priority that the, the federal government is focusing on encouraging and incentivizing universities to collaborate with industry. And the government has made it really clear that we want job ready graduates. And what better way to provide these job ready graduates is than through the research and the connections that you're going to hear more about tonight. I told you I was going to use one model to illustrate some of what we're doing with our living lab and collaborations. And tonight I've chosen to talk a bit about how this work that we're doing at the university aligns with national and in fact global priorities. There's been a lot of publications lately, a lot of articles in the paper and other places that talk about our national strategy, our hydrogen strategy, national hydrogen roadmaps. Here at the university, we formed a hydrogen task force. We're looking to build a cluster in the area and hydrogen hubs. So you'll probably, I hope, continue to hear a lot more about these activities. And we'll ask our guests, who all have a tangential uh, association with this hydrogen and the hydrogen roadmap, a few questions about about that today as well as how they have been engaged with the university. But first, let me stop and step back. About 20 years ago, it seems like it wasn't that long ago, but in 1997, there was a book that put out by Donald Stokes. And if you haven't seen this book, I'd encourage you to take a look. It talks about the pasture's quadrant. And when I first read the book, I thought this really resonates with me because as a scientist, I'd often thought of life and research in a very linear fashion. There were the group of scientists that did very basic research. And in this quadrant here, if those of you who remember back to your uh, year 12, you probably remember Niels Bohr and learning all about the atomic theory. Well, that's very basic research. And maybe that's all the basic research that you remember from year 12. I don't know, but it's still important. And then 
there were those that did very applied research. And a, a typical example of this is what Thomas Edison did in all his experiences. He had 10,000 failures on the way to making the, the right filament for the light bulb, but he got there. But it was a trial and error by use inspired. But what Donald Stokes promotes is it doesn't have to be basic or applied we could actually have a fourth area where these two areas intersect and in a two-dimensional form a quadrant that he called the Pasteur's Quadrant, named after a lot of the famous work that Louis Pasteur, a French biologist, microbiologist did. You probably perhaps heard of some of the, the pasteurization of milk or, or other beverages. But this work was really both basic fundamental research and also use-inspired research. And it's really an area of this intersection that became more of a passion of the types of research that I really like to engage and encourage. But let's take this a step further. I was involved in the United States in a, in a number of groups, and one of them was the High Bar Research Association. And you may hear more about High Bar Research here at the university because I think that we might become one of the first international members. But what this, what this uh, does is adds the element of engagement to this area known as the Pasteur's Quadrant. So first, if you take on the left, the Pasteur's Quadrant that we just discussed, and what I like to do is turn it on its end diagonally to imply that basic or use-inspired research, one isn't more important than the other at all. But where the magic happens is when we take this to the third dimension and we add engagement. We add engagement with our local government, state government, federal government, community members, our natives, our neighbors, our industrial and commercial members. All of the people that make up our community come together and this is what makes this research so powerful. The research that we do is not research that's designed in a silver city alone in a university. It's research that's begun by dialogue with our engaged partners. It's continued side by side with our researchers working with other researchers and with these partners. And it's continued with the help of these partners to actually move into the community and pre give us real solutions to real world problems. This really ties in. It's so exciting to tie into our engagement priorities. As we dive into our strategic plan, I think that the engagement priorities have picked four beautiful areas of focus that really resonate with things that we have in the Hunter that are so important. Better, healthier living, next generation resources, connecting communities, and growing industries. And we try to do this in a model called the living laboratory model that really unites invention and discovery and engagement and embraces all these parts. And I think you'll see that in several of the examples tonight. Now, I really wanted to give a sneak preview of perhaps some coming up lectures because we have so much research here. So I'm going to give a very micro vision of two or three other projects that are ongoing in the university before we move into our hydrogen project. So first, engineers and scrubs. I think there's not a person in the audience or, or online that hasn't realized that we're in a very challenging year in 2020 with COVID. Well, I think this is the perfect opportunity for the university to step up and do some of the things it needs to do. And our university here at Newcastle has done that. There were needs with proper ventilators. Many of you have heard the amp control story. There were needs to produce face shields. And I think you've heard from our last speaker, Paul Dostor, who was very involved in rapid prototyping. There were needs for sanitizers. And so what was fun was that here at the university, our scientists, our engineers, our biomedical sciences met with the local community, with our collaborators at HMRI, with our collaborators at the local New England Health District, and with many of our community partners to develop new products and rapid, rapid solutions. So that's all I get to tell you about that tonight. Uh, many of you also know about these very important research about contamination assessment and re remediation in the environment. 
And this is a, a story here that, again, I'm only going to give you a snippet about. It's led by Professor Ravi Nadu here at the university. It's a cooperative research center program, which the logos you can't see on the left intentionally are the original 29 partners, which have even expanded since then. But this is a program that was started in partnership by the Australian government, Department of Industry, Science, Energy, and Resources. And we really have had so many successes out of this. If you can squint and see in the picture, I think you'll see one of our panelists is actually in a visit in this picture, and she might talk about some of the things she experienced as she saw uh, firsthand Ravi's, uh, a bit of Ravi's work. And here's another teaser of what's coming up with some work around uh, work that was really driven by stakeholder engagement in an effort to um, look at the nuisance of biting uh, on the campus. And I'll tell you, from the time I spent in Minnesota, the mosquitoes here don't worry me. But this work was uh, really a genesis of some of the work of a, a project that came out of 2019's The Vices Grand Challenge on Mosquitoes and has been now a collaboration that's looking at a, bacterial, uh, a bacteria that can suppress the virus replication. Again, I'm not going to tell you much more about this, but it just shows that our work here doesn't occur in isolation. CSIRO is an important partner. The city of Newcastle is an important partner. We partner with other universities that I won't name out loud, but they are shown on the screen. They're important in too. So the government, and then certainly the philanthropy and the generosity of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is very important in all this. So with those teasers, let's be moving to the hydrogen economy. Hydrogen is simple. It's two atoms. Dihydrogen is what it is, technically. I actually know quite a bit about hydrogen. The chancellor didn't tell this in an introduction, but I've run two major research projects around hydrogen. One actually very, very basic and understanding molecular structure of hydrogen complexes, and one very, very applied in terms of running fuel stations. But I don't do research anymore. I just help enable it. But if you look at this complex picture and you start reading about hydrogen, there's so many parts to hydrogen. We need to make hydrogen. We can use hydrogen. We can store hydrogen. We can transport and export hydrogen. We can ship hydrogen to places that don't have it, or we can ship products that are made with hydrogen to places. Uh, it's used for things such as a, a production of ammonia. And I think that many of these uh, other areas are things that you've heard about quite a bit. So what we're looking to do is really build some infrastructure here in the Hunter to have a hydrogen hub that can interact with the university, that can interact with those folks that can really do the technical innovations that are needed to firsthand interact with the energy generators, the energy consumers, our partners like CSIRO, local government, companies such as Orica, in terms of some of the things that are really important to drive this. And I think we're timed with a very, very important intersection of time and opportunity and region to really lead some of this work here. So with that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show a short video of one of the projects that is ongoing here at the university that has integrated into our hydrogen work. And I think you'll um, enjoy seeing firsthand some of the technical work that's happening. The Hydro Harvester is an atmospheric water generation technology developed at the University of Newcastle. It is capable of extracting moisture from the air and producing water for drinking or irrigation at any location. The hydro harvester absorbs water from the air at night using silica gel. During the day, solar thermal energy or waste heat is used to produce a hot, humid air stream. This air is then cooled using ambient air as a heat sink to produce water. Our approach makes the process independent of the ambient temperature and humidity, which is a key limitation of existing refrigeration-based technology. Refrigeration-based technologies operate by cooling air below the dew point. This requires a lot of electrical energy to cool large volumes of air. The hydro harvester works by initially heating the air and then using this hot air to desorb water from the silica gel. Hot air holds significantly more water vapor than cold air, so cooling hot humid air to ambient temperature requires less air to be cooled. The hydro harvester uses significantly less electrical energy than existing technologies and can operate over a wide range of conditions. It can also be coupled with waste heat from any process, which further reduces the cost of the technology. The first hydro harvester prototype reached the final of the Water Abundance X Prize 
and was highly commended at the Institute of Chemical Engineers Global Awards in 2018. Three prototypes have been developed so far, with the performance of the technology improving with each modification. This project will allow the design of the hydro harvester to be finalised and the technology to be ready for manufacturing and deployment. Let me see if I can... Uh, there we go. So this is just one example of, of, of nearly two dozen projects here at the university that have to do with hydrogen. This featured Professor Badad Modadari's hydrogen harvester. And it was a funded project by the Australian Renewable Energy Agency. But what you can see in this picture now is putting together the pieces. So on the front right, you see this hydro harvester. This harvester is providing a water source. And it's very important in electrolysis to produce hydrogen and oxygen from the splitting of water to have ultra pure water, which is an expensive proposition. And so this has solved one of those puzzle, pieces of the puzzle. The green unit, the storage looking unit behind the hydro harvester actually houses an electrolyzer, which is what splits the water into hydrogen and oxygen. And you'll see that behind there are some solar panels. So the energy to run this hydro harvester, to run the electrolyzer, is coming from a renewable source. And then the hydrogen is stored in these red cylinders, ready to go on to other parts of the, the story that you're going to hear about more. But it's really exciting, too. And when we meet with one of our guests, I think you'll hear a neat piece about the oxygen, a waste product, a byproduct from this reaction. So with this, I'm going to conclude my, my part of the conversation and invite us to turn to our guests. We have three panelists guests today. Uh, Dr. Priscilla Tremaine is, um, is a, a researcher here at the university. She has been at the university for a number of years. She's a first generation uh, university student and she came from none less than here in the Newcastle area from Toronto. I've really um, gotten to enjoy meeting Priscilla and hearing her story, and I hope the cameras are starting to, to go onto stage to our guests. Um, really exciting work. Priscilla was an undergraduate here. She was a graduate here, and I think she's well on her way to becoming an amazing academic, independent academic here at the university. Second, I'd like to introduce Ms. Morvan Cameron, who's the Chief Executive Officer from the Lake Macquarie City Council. When I met Morvan, I really want to say that I was struck by how passionate she is about excellence and innovation in local government. And so why invite her to the panel? Well, I think she thinks very strategically about new ways to do things. And I hope she'll talk a little bit today about the creation of the economic development company Dantia and part of her vision behind that. Uh, frankly, also, I owe Morvan a big thanks to helping introducing me to the sailing scene. So this is the way I'm repaying you for such kindness. And lastly, I'd like to introduce Dr. Kirsten Malloy, who is a business leader who has served as a company director on a wide range of boards, including NRMA, the Hunter Water, and um, the HMRI. Kirsten and I have a very similar background. We're both chemists, and her dad was an academic here. My dad was an academic as well. And I've had the pleasure of serving this year beside Kirsten on the HMRI board, and I know that she's really contributing to the guiding the partnership of HMRI, the university, and the local health district to really make a difference to community. I also would like to introduce now, she'll be joining us a little bit later, Dr. Natalie Tamotana, who is a professor in the School of Mathematics and Physical Sciences. And Natalie is also a member of the New South Wales chapter of the Royal Society. So Natalie will help uh, moderate and discuss, uh, facilitate some of the discussion. I know that all the slides have had a QR code. So those of you in the audience who have questions and those of you who want to send in questions to the QR code, Natalie we will help pass those on to our guests. And so with further ado, no further ado, I'd like to join our panel. Well, good evening. Thank you so much for being here. Right. Thanks for Great having to meet us. You. Priscilla, can you tell us a little bit more of your story of coming to the University of Newcastle? I think the audience would love to hear a bit more of what made you come here and perhaps is Newcastle a typical university, and is it what you expected? 
Yeah, so I grew up in Toronto, which is located in Lake Macquarie, um, around Newcastle. And so I went to high school there and I was always interested in going to university. My parents had instilled it in me since I, I was young. Go to university, get as high as you can, do, do as much as you can. Um, and because Newcastle is so close to Sydney, there's a lot of universities in Sydney that are really, they have the draw cards of that they're ranked higher than Newcastle and they're very academically prestigious. But we had some visitors from the university come to our um, high school and present to us and I really saw there was um, an industry focus with the degrees that they offered at the university. Um, so they came to us and they said, we're working with all of these mining companies, the energy companies, manufacturing in our region. And that was what really drew me to stay here. It was that industry focused as well as um, the academic side of the university. Thanks, Priscilla. It's great to have you. And I'm really happy to have gotten to know you through these years. And I hope we continue our relationship. Can't wait. <laughs> So Morvan, in the introduction, I hinted that I might be asking you a little bit about Dantia and, and how you think differently about innovation and delivering services differently. Can you talk a little bit about that for us, please? Sure, yeah, Janet. Um, I'm not sure about the thinking differently. Let me talk about Dantia. So we created the Lake Macquarie Economic Development Company in 2014. And uh, at that time, we were really looking at the city's economy and looking at what was happening. We, are, uh, we were a city full of very traditional industries and those industries were, were changing and were going to change very quickly. And we felt as a city that we needed to uh, do something different in order to uh, support and assist our economy. Lake Macquarie, uh, partly through geography, has a history of not delivering the services to the community, but enabling the community to, to deliver services for themselves. So we don't run our sports fields and our tennis courts and our community buildings. We enable local community groups to do that. Um, my background was in community development and therefore I knew that model. And when uh, given the responsibility of rethinking economic development, it seemed like a logical way to do it was to use a similar model and engage local business people who live in the city uh, had built businesses, were building businesses in the city to actually participate and contribute to uh, forming this company. Uh, and, and really that the board, are, the board is made up of nine people, the mayor and myself and seven local business people who, who give up their time and contribute um, with the vision of growing and supporting the economy in our city. That's great. We'll love to hear more about how economic development fits into this story and this engagement. Mm -hmm. What about how, how can the university work more with uh, the, the council and with Dantia and with SMEs and big business and small business? Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. I think um, if I can go back to your four, your four quadrants, uh, lo local government tends to live down in that bottom quadrant of we're doers. People who work in local government work there because they like to solve the problem and, and deliver services. Um, and I see when we, when we talked originally, I see a really great convergence between um, uh, those of us who live in the space of just solve the problem and get on and deliver and pure science. And if we can meet in the middle, uh, I think the university can offer us tremendous support to um, improve our data analytics and improve our research and our testing. We are continually uh, trying to instill, test, try, you know, be, be brave to deliver services differently. And I think the university can provide a huge amount of uh, support to our, uh, to our employees in, in, that, uh, in that space so that we can continue to um, really deliver high quality services to our community. Thank you, Marvin. Kirsten, you and I have had a lot of different conversations in a lot of different ways, and I've been just struck with the number of different career experiences <laughs> you've had and how you've been able to synthesize these. And I think um, it's really struck me about your passion for partnerships. Perhaps can you reflect on some of your experiences and how they've shaped your thoughts about partnerships? Yeah, sure. Um, certainly. Um, in my career, I seem to have worked across a lot of partnerships and even my PhD was uh, industry sponsored um, as well as university sponsored. So I think it's one of those patterns through your life. 
Um, I enjoy the process of trying to understand how to make partnerships work, their collaborations, and there's always multiple parties involved by the very nature of them, which means there's complexity in understanding everyone's needs and finding that sweet spot where there's an alignment mm -hmm. um, and a value that can be released and shared amongst the participants in a way that, that, that um, means it's worth the energy and the effort to collaborate um, because it is more time, more talking, more discussion and more processes need to be set up so people can trust the process of how the, the partnership's actually managed. Um, I think smaller scale things can be done on a more individual basis and, and things like that, but once things start to scale, you really need mm -hmm. those processes because there will be conflict, there will be differences in view, and those things need to be resolved um, and they need to be driven by um, a belief and hopefully a reality that there's value to be unleashed through uh, people working together because it's quite hard for people to work together. I think um, often um, we like our own way of doing things and we have our own answers to everything. And, um, and so there really has to be some sort of a, a fundamental value or a real value driver that, that, that brings people together. But I find um, it's incredibly rewarding because the value that can be unleashed through working with others and through um, recognising that we probably only know a, a few percent of <laughs> you know, what we can contribute to any one environment, not 100%. Um, there's always that opportunity to learn. So it's incredibly rewarding, but um, it can take patience, resilience, time, and yeah, incredibly good process to underpin how those engagements work. Do you have any insights to what makes some of the successes work? What's the secret sauce to those processes that you're talking about? I do think there is a mindset around collaboration um, that that's something that it's beyond you and you as an individual. So I think um, having that right sort of leadership and sometimes the right pressure points just to, to push push through sometimes what seem like perhaps insurmountable challenges <laughs> to, to let a bigger picture take place and that sometimes in collaborations you absolutely have to step back and say, I was a little bit of that but none of us are going to be all of it and let people share in the wins. Um, so I think that's, uh, yeah, that's a really um, important component. Great. Priscilla, from your view as a student and as an emerging academic, how have you seen industry and the community engage with the university? Well, I think, so I work at the Newcastle Institute of Energy and Resources, and so that's sort of a real hub for the university of industry engaging with the university. And so a lot of our research is actually funded by industry. Um, and so that usually comes about with government initiatives such as ARENA, we've got ARC linkage, we've got um, innovation connections, which is more for small, medium enterprises. Um, and those are good ways for industry to engage with the university. But we also have had another side of it where We've gone out and showcased some of the basic research we've been doing through press releases. An example of that was the water harvester that you showed earlier in your presentation. So we originally designed that process as part of a competition that we entered. We showcased it through some press releases and from just getting that out into the community, we got a lot of leads into uh, forming more industry partnerships. So that was how we um, got into that arena project um, with the renewable hydrogen and the renewable methane. Um, it was just getting that point of contact, people having a face to, to contact and engage um, in order to basically form that partnership with industry. And what do you find that's important once you've made that initial connection? What keeps it going? How do you keep engaged? And I think that's, that's the problem, I think, with academics and industry often industry finds academia is moving too slow um, when they're not keeping up with the pace that they want. So we've really found in our research group that the way to keep the partnership going is to, from the beginning, set realistic targets and then keep uh, delivering on what we say we're going to deliver. And if you can do that with industry, they're happy to keep coming back and working with you if they've got more problems, uh, if you can continue to solve them um, in a timely manner. It's really just remembering that we really have alignment. We really want a lot of the same goals. That's it. So, so you hinted and, and talked a little bit about uh, one funding source, ARENA. 
Uh, Morvan, are you able to talk, I'm going to turn a little to hydrogen now. I think you've been involved with an arena project with hydrogen. Are you able to share any of the details about that? I can at a high level, Janet. Uh, okay. we've, we've got a current um, uh, grant application actually in with the arena um, that is looking to, uh, it's a very long project and, and it's a pretty, pretty large project certainly by local government standards. But the ultimate aim, if it all works, is that we will actually convert our uh, garbage trucks, our waste fleet, uh, to run on hydrogen as opposed to running on, we currently run on diesel fuel. Um, there's a number of stages for us to get through, but ultimately we would end up with a hydrolyzer uh, owned, not by us, by one of the partners in the grant, um, and we would over time replace, we've got 23 waste, general waste uh, trucks, um, if successful, I would like to think that we also run, we don't run, but we have in our city recycling trucks and uh, green waste trucks. And if you exponentially think what's possible out of that grant, uh, I don't know the numbers in the Hunter, but we'd be in the hundreds of, of heavy vehicles. And that's only waste. Um, if we can prove this technology with heavy vehicles, per with the particular stop-start stop nature, uh, of waste trucks, then then the general heavy vehicle industry um, will have tremendous knowledge about the opportunities that hydrogen will present as a as a fuel for the future. I think that's a, a great. I know you can't give us a lot more details than that, but it really is a, a way to spark our imagination and our thoughts about that. So yeah. so so Kirsten, I'm going to turn to this. I know that you have a, a, a really strength and a background in resources. Can you give some insights from your perspective of of what do you see as what kind of impact hydrogen could have in our region? What are some other examples? Um, yes, certainly. I, I guess as a, a source of electricity, um, it can play a vital role. Clearly, and I think you had the data up there, it's 83% of the state's electricity is generated through the Central Coast and the Hunter. And because um, that's predominantly coal. Um, and we know one of the coal-fired power stations will be closing. So um, clearly, um, a hydrogen solution um, has a very different um, sustainability footprint. So that's uh, you know a real positive. It's also um, very sensible to use other infrastructure to the maximum ability that we can. So we have um, the infrastructure in place to uh, to you know move electricity where it needs to go. So in terms of utilising that infrastructure, it makes a lot of sense for this part of the world to continue to be a, an important um, energy and electricity generator for the, for the state and the country. Um, and so really important that this kind of project, uh, a hydrogen project, is happening uh, in this part of the world because I think that's got a really important role to play. Um, and really that base load electricity is really quite important. You know, solar is great, but... Um, it's only there when the sun shines. Yes. <laughs> and so that's a, you know, a challenge. So yeah, really important, I think, opportunity and exciting to see a focus on it in the region. And from a chemist point of view, I, I think you probably understand a lot of the chemistry that occurred at Orca <laughs> when you worked there in the ammonia. Can you talk about the other value streams oh, that certainly. can come out of hydrogen? Yeah, and certainly, I mean, we've got a manufacturing footprint here and, and I think we've seen the importance in COVID times of maintaining and growing that. So there's an, an energy sort of requirement. Um, certainly um, one of the products made um, at Orica is ammonia um, at, the, at the plant there. So um, certainly anything that um, you know, enables that product, it's a product that's, that's in commercial use um, for lots of different things. So yeah, definitely is an um, input to making ammonia. It's a, got potential. And I'm sure there's many others, and my chemistry's a little lapsed at this point. <laughs> I'll confess. Uh, I, can, I can give you a briefer of chemistry, but they come mostly in jokes these days instead of in lectures. So we'll save those for our drinks afterwards. <laughs> Priscilla, uh, it was really fun to hear a little bit about the genesis of some of the hydrogen renewable projects that you've been working on with the Priority Research Center here. One of the things that ha has struck me is, and I mentioned it with the video, is some of your involvement in some follow-up projects with PFAS. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can explain a little bit about what PFAS is and why the oxygen that's a byproduct from this hydrogen production could actually tie into this story so nicely. Yeah, so um, PFAS is actually uh, an environmental contaminant, so it's out there in the environment at the moment. There's a big issue up at Williamtown. It was found in firefighting foams, so it's contaminated soils and waters 
basically across Australia, wherever they've used these firefighting firms, particularly at um, defence bases. Um, and so there's a lot of um, interest in trying to find a way that we can basically dest destroy this, this PFAS um, substance because um, it basically sustains itself in the soils and um, the waters for an extensive period of time. So the main way that they uh, destroy the PFAS at the moment is to uh, thermally treat it. Um, so that requires a lot of energy um, and there's no real uh, useful products that you can get out of that. So with our work that we were doing on renewable hydrogen, um, so our director at our research centre, uh, Professor Badad Mokhtadari, um, he initially came up with this concept that we could make some value-added products um, from PFAS contaminated waters. So uh, to produce hydrogen, uh, you can uh, reform methane. So you basically add methane and water into a reactor and then out of that you produce CO2 and hydrogen. So basically what uh, his initial concept was, was to uh, react PFAS contaminated water um, with methane and then you produce uh, this hydrogen but then you also get some other useful byproducts. Um, this was an initial concept that Badat had come up with um, and then we found an industry partner, um, Evocra, who also have uh, a technology to concentrate this PFAS contaminated water. So it basically takes some of the water out so you've got a more concentrated substance um, and they actually use um, ozone in order to uh, concentrate this water. So um, using that oxygen to uh, basically uh, screen the water, I suppose, and concentrate it down into uh, something that's uh, more useful in our process where we get this hydrogen product. But then we also have some other useful byproducts um, as a result of this reforming process that can be used in other um, chemical industries. So, yeah, that's one of the interesting yeah. ones that it sort of went through a whole process. We started with this hydrogen, but then it has applications in other um, industries like solving contamination problems. Yeah, it's interesting from some of my experiences in industry too, that sometimes you have a byproduct and you are, are paying to get rid of it and you can find a value stream, sell your byproduct, and sometimes the byproduct makes more money than an initial product. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> Not a bad problem to have, that's is it? it? <laughs> Well, staying on some of our scientific theme, I know that um, we were really, really delighted to host you, Morvan, here a few weeks ago to see near our, our, inner, our institute and to have a chance to visit some of the labs. Uh, it is great. Um, I think it's probably the first university that I've had local government agree to come on site and, and, and don the white coats and glasses. <laughs> but one of the things that was so exciting that um, really, I think, illustrates some of this industrial pull for our research was when Rob Bobby was talking about one of his technologies and it struck to you about a question about black slag. Would you mind recanting some of that story? Yeah, certainly. Um, I'm embarrassed to say I've been in the region about 15 years and it was the first time I'd visited near, but um, geez, it was fantastic. Uh, I can't remember the specifics of the story, but Ravi was talking about how there was a, a, a soil with contaminant in it and uh, he and his team had sort of processed it to the point where they had been able to make the soil, get the contaminant out of the soil and actually use, uh, uh, much like uh, Priscilla's story, use the, the contaminant as a byproduct. And um, I had with me a couple of people from my team and we all looked at one another and said, well, you need to tell us what you can do with black slag. So um, black slag uh, is a byproduct from the lead and zinc smelter that was in our city for well over 100 years. I found out the other day it was the first heavy industry uh, factory in the, Hunter, in the Hunter region and it was in the late 1800s. Uh, it, it operated until about 2001 in a site in our city and uh, produced two, two contaminants, an airborne contaminant, but more importantly, and, and black slag is a, is a byproduct. And uh, it, was a, it was considered a fan, it's, it's got everything in it, um, lead, zinc, a uh, bit of silver, a bit of cadmium, all sorts of things. Traditionally, it's a kind of glass, um, uh, glass sort of texture, and it was historically thought that all of the um, contaminants were bound in the glass, so it was a safe product. 
uh, it, it, it compacts really well and it drains really well. So if you're building a road, it's perfect. If you're building a sports field or a park, it's perfect. If you're building your own driveway, it's perfect. Um, and as a result, we have black slag literally right across our city. Uh, we believe in the 100 years, about 2.1 million tonnes was produced. And people used to, anecdotally, I, I, people used to turn up with their trailer and just take a little, lot of back black slag from the factory gate to do their garden, to build their driveway, as well as council using it uh, for many years. We stopped, I, I believe, in the 70s. Um, our, our management at the minute in most of the city is simply to cap and contain uh, because to do anything else is just uh, extremely cost prohibitive. So when Ravi was telling the story about taking soil and getting all of these contaminants out of it and being able to do something with it, um, Tim and, and Debbie and I all went, we need to send you a bag full of this stuff. Now, it, it, you know, it may be that it's not possible. There's obviously got to be a cost-effective element given where we, we know there's more than a million tons still in the city. Um, but we all got pretty excited and that's progressed. We, we've, we've written a brief for Ravi's team and, um, and they're, you know, they'll be commencing any time now, starting to see if there's something they can do, um, they can do to help our city. As a city council, we have the problem on our facilities, but a huge number of our residents have also have that problem. So um, it's not just a, a, a council to uh, council to university. This is this this has opportunities for our entire community. And really, the community could really impact and Massively. benefit. You know, uh, Kirsten, I'm going to turn to you. I, I have seen. Um, this is a great story, but I have seen it's been a hurdle a lot of times to get that initial dialogue happening. I, uh, the, the scientists, engineers, researchers that I know are, are, are yearning to do something, and industry or, or others often have a problem, but we can't, it's a hurdle to have that be told and heard and say, oh, I can fix that. What other hurdles have you seen working across major industries? And do you have any solutions to, to how we might solve them other than having everybody come to near every day of the week? <laughs> yeah, I think, um, I mean, connectivity is a hugely important thing and it's certainly where innovation happens is where there's a lot of um, often informal contact, even within businesses, where you have a lot of informal contact between different teams mm -hmm. and different groups. Um, then you'll, you'll get an exchange, an idea, and then things will, will grow from there. And uh, so I think it's a sort of a multifaceted sort of strategy around how, how you engage and deliberately and in quite a formal way and um, putting um, you know, the Vice Chancellor's challenges out there and things like that draws in lots of people all the way through to informal contact and trying to make sure that that, that happens so that these sorts of conversations mm. do just start because um, uh, that's really where, you know, where ideas do, be, do begin. Um, and I think, um, I've certainly seen the university reaching out, and I know this university has a really, um, rates very, very highly on its industry partnerships, and I think it's got to do yeah. with that industrial history and, and things like that. Um, not to say that there's not more opportunity. I've certainly also found both being a student, but then also being kind of an employer, having um, students come through businesses. Mm. Um, and there's a real, there is sort of a continuum between sort of something that's very driven by the uni and, you know, it might be your IP and things like that and bringing people into businesses to then work on some things um, all the way through to then, you know, you, you get to see that person and, and, and what value they can offer and they move more into the business over time, but maintaining the connections with the university. So I think um, the big focus on, on having um, work integrated learning as part of um, what you do here is really important because it will also bring people who've been in business a long time um, into conversations with, with students and, and people who are studying and researchers. So, I think it's, um, you know, everything from quite formal, deliberate um, activities all the way through to lots of informal things and, and Newcastle and the Hunter and the Central Coast is a, of a size where, you know, we can get across the industries that are here and, and understand them. So, yeah, I think um, encouraging communication is probably the main thing, but an informal connection is really, really important and probably as important, if not more important sometimes in the formal the formal connections. So we hope to be able to, to structure the unstructured then, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> oh, well, pretty soon I think we're going to turn to some questions. So Natalie, you might be um, thinking of, of getting ready this. Um, uh, 
Actually, I'm talking about the stereotype. You talked quite a bit, a little bit, or a little bit, I guess, about local governments being trapped in the day to day. And, and a university being at this research driven. Do you want to follow up a little bit on Kirsten's um, comments and how do we get over these hurdles? Mm, yeah, sure. I think, um, I think there needs to be, uh, well, I think there are two things. From Lake Macquarie's perspective, we have, it's only when you start asking that you suddenly find that as an organization, we've got lots of involvement in, with the university already, uh, all, right through the, um, right through the organization. Often we, it just happens and, and we don't know about it. Um, but I think um, really, uh, and I think we, we might talk about it later, but we, we're talking currently about an MOU and a, and a, and a partnership agreement. Um, in my experience, it's about, for local government, it's about really giving permission to the staff to reach out and say, call somebody at the uni they probably know, and also making sure that there's somebody at the uni that if they call, they get a, a friendly, it, you know, it, it's mm -hmm. quite, in, they can be quite intimidating. So can local government council buildings be quite intimidating buildings if you're going in there for a, you know, if you're not sure what you're doing. But universities can be quite daunting places. So for me, uh, we'll talk a bit, but the, the whole partnership agreement is about really flagging to anyone in the organization. And we, this is a, a cultural, uh, we really instill in our staff, if you've got a problem, you have to share it, even within the, our own organization. Mm -hmm. I think there's enough, another level for us now to say, you know, there'll be very few problems in local government that someone else hasn't come up against. And isn't, maybe if they haven't solved it, they've at least started to think about solving. And I really think the university here can help, can help us, certainly with our encouragement, our staff just broadening their horizons and, and having a, an, an institute that horizon scans all the time and can, can support our staff. For me, it's about really enabling the staff to feel comfortable and confident to reach out. And on these hurdles, Priscilla, do you have any other thoughts to add? I mean, I think as Morven and I think Kirsten touched on, it's like, it's having, like, universities are daunting. Mm. Mm. It's like giving industry a point of contact like giving them someone that they can talk to engage with and then send them in the right direction point them to someone who can help and it's about yeah getting that communication started like so it, it being informal like starting on that level and then slowly progressing through to something that I, that is formal Great. Well, I really enjoyed leading some of this conversation with our guest tonight, and I'd like to, to turn to Natalie. I think you've been collecting some questions from the audience. Yes, we do. We have some questions now, Jeanette. So the first question, can you tell us more about the new MOU between <laughs> the universities and Lake Macquarie Council? Yeah, um, I'll start by saying uh, I've got an aversion to the term MOU or Memorandum of Understanding. Um, it's just legal and intimidating term that the lawyers understand and everybody else goes, what's that? Uh, so um, we're, we, we refer to it and hopefully the, the agreement will end up being referred to as a partnership agreement. And it really is about saying, uh, funnily enough, we had the first session to start to construct the, the agreement uh, recently. And it's amazing how similar uh, the university's new values um, and focus areas in your strategic plan are to council's values. And, and you've even got one connected communities and it's also one, one of ours. I mean, the similarities are immense. So I think it's about drawing those similarities, uh, giving a framework to the relationship. Uh, but for me, the most important thing is at the back end of the agreement, uh, there's a list of projects that actually says in the short term, this is what we're going to work on together. In the medium term, this is what we're going to work on together. And we actually then meet regularly so that you get both formal and informal connection. Um, and we actually can show in six months and a year's time the benefit that the community, in the end, it's about the community, both the university community and, and the hunter community have gained from us working collectively together as opposed to working in different quadrants, um, to use uh, the analogy that, that Janet gave us earlier. Oh, thank you. Okay, so the next question, start with the comments. 
it's so impressive to see such a strong panels of women in STEM, <laughs> building partnership, partnership with industry. So this question is for Priscilla. What strategies have you put in place to build your network with industry and research in STEM? Um, so I think it's there's a lot of networking events out there that um, we can take part in. I know even just Engineers Australia, we have things um, related to STEM, and then there's the um, the HunterNet, the women's um, women in STEM sort of network in in Newcastle. Um, but then in terms of like uh, engaging with industry, uh, it's it's all about those. Uh, government initiatives that, that are there, um, them coming to the university, engaging there, and then us being able to uh, form a partnership with them and then deliver on whatever projects or um, ideas that um, we've come up with. And Janet, the university has a platform to um, foster this partnership, the women in STEM with the industry? and. Yes, we do have we do have the STEM Alliance, and I think some of the examples of the the women in engineering scrubs is coming out of that, and we have other uh, alliances too to help form it too. But let me add to that too. I think it's broader in my view than just STEM. It's really all the scholarship, creative activity, and research that all comes together. And I think sometimes we we focus a lot on the STEM, but we forget about all the interdisciplinary actions. I can, I can just reflect on, on one of the events I got to go to this weekend, which was um, very, very, very touching to me. It involved a project with Hunter Water and the university and with uh, the local um, school, Newcastle High. Many of you know that, that our Pro Vice Chancellor, Nathan Towney, used to be the principal at, uh, at Newcastle High School. It was a project that he envisioned he worked with a number of, uh, of students. They were mostly um, from the Wabakal and the Waramai tribes. And they envisioned a story, a story to help, help explain using culture and using creative methods of how do we help communicate how important it is to preserve our water and be there for the future. And I thought, this is a creative project. This falls just into the same types of things we're talking about. It's not STEM, but it's really broad across our university. It's lovely. So this question is for all the three panelists. So besides the hydrogen hub projects and other projects that Janet has mentioned, can you identify some other opportunities for us to work together? Where do we start? Mm. <laughs> I've got a list this long. Yeah. <laughs> 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 There's so many. There's no one. <laughs> if you sort of start with, um, you know, I think the, the values and things you had up earlier, Janet, are really good because they, they cover a lot of the concerns we have about community, about environment and sustainability, about how to grow. Um, and there's just lots of opportunity, lots of problems to solve um, and lots of things. And I, I agree, I'm very passionate about STEM, women in STEM, but I also think it's really important that um, I think a lot of innovation is going to come from multidisciplinary um, activity and the ability for people in very different professions um, and different skill sets coming together. Actually, it's a really huge part of successful collaboration is, is actually how you, how you uh, leverage difference um, because I think uh, the solutions that we need for a lot of these problems are very complex. There's social aspects to them, there's technical aspects to them, um, community aspects. So there's, there's all sorts of things that we have to think about. So I think it's a huge, I think it's a really long list. And I think the thing about ideas, when you sort of say, how do we um, tap into that, is that there's going to be so many and it's then filtering through and, and trying to figure out how to prioritise probably too many opportunities mm -hmm. versus the amount of resource um, we actually have. Yeah, and I think to add to that, from a university perspective, like the, the, the ideas and projects that we pursue are usually ones that are going to be funded. So if we can basically form these partnerships and then find it areas of new funding, um, it's, it's much easier if we have the partnership, we know the problem that we need to solve, then we can actually attack that and have proper funding to basically get the solution that we need. Um, if we're not forming these partnerships and working to get like the list of things that we can work on is endless. Um, and then we're always trying to come up with new ideas that we think are going to attract that funding. But if we can create that um, engagement before we start 
on the, the mind map of what we need to do, then we're already on the trail to finding a solution because we know we're going to have the proper resources in order to, to get to, through to the solution. Yeah, that gave me time to filter all the, the, the <laughs> long ideas. Um, look, look, already we, we work really closely, and, and I'll probably give some examples of, of the projects we're already working on. Um, we're working very closely with Professor Roberta Ryan, who's a, a local government uh, local government expert. I was so excited when I heard Roberta was coming to, to Newcastle and she's, she's new uh, here. Even just the fact that, that Newcastle University have chosen uh, to appoint Roberta as a, a local government academic for me was a real um, was a real positive. We're working with Roberta on a whole lot of um, a whole lot of work around community consultation and community engagement, which is one of her her passions. We're also working with her a little bit on on uh, data analysis and how we present our data. Uh, you know, we collect collect a lot of information from our community about how they feel about this or whether they like this or that, um, and and. Uh, we can we can definitely um, Im improve the way that's presented and the readability and the understanding of it with um, with some assistance from Roberta's team. We're doing that. Um, I'll share a great story if I've got time. We ran a year and a half ago. We ran a, a, an architecture uh, competition with uh, with the uh, faculty here uh, for a performing arts space, the multi arts pavilion uh, in Spears Point Park. That'll begin construction before Christmas. Uh, and it was a student, it was a Newcastle, open to Newcastle University students. One of the students won. Uh, she's now in Sydney working, but she's about to see her first ever building um, mm. being constructed, uh, what, a year, maybe a year and a half after, after finishing. Um, that's been a fantastic project. It'll be the first multi arts uh, place of its type in, uh, we think, in Australia, certainly on the eastern seaboard. It's uh, modelled on some of the sort of pop-up venues you see in the Biennale um, in Europe and in, in other places in Europe. So we've already got a lot of these, um, a lot of these opportunities. And um, yeah, as soon as I start thinking about it, I can think of 10 more. <laughs> the problem is filtering. And that's one of the reasons with the partnership agreement is why it's so important to put down a few is otherwise we'll do a little bit in too many. And, and the story about what we're, what we're creating and, and how we're succeeding will be so much harder to tell. Um, and really the, the idea of saying, let's, let's focus and, and, and you know, move on um, is about that idea of the list just endless. Well, I think time's is up for me. And um, even though we have uh, many questions, Dennis and her team will compile the questions and then answer that and put the answer ups online. So thank you so much for the panels. And I'll hand this floor back to Janet. Thank you. Great, Natalie. Yes. Thanks so much. But before you go away, Natalie, maybe I can ask you that same question that you just asked us. Totally put you on the spot. <laughs> Either as a, as a professor here at the university with your own research or with your engagement with the Royal Society, where do you see some of the most pressing questions? There's a lots of questions. I just ran this, um, the workshops on mathematics in industry study group where we um, mathematicians get together and then we look for questions that can be solved with mathematics and computer science. So there's a lots of questions out there. So in terms of, um, so we deal with industries such as the, um, the con crush, which is the um, dust modeling. We deal with problems in level spring where they're doing um, furnace. They try to build the furnace to um, 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 optimize the energy um, using, and also we're doing it with lots of other things. So actually, uh, there's a lots of mathematical problem out there that we can we can solve. And yeah, so for me, um, there's an opportunity that mathematicians can help. And it's good to know that industry could you know benefit from having the mathematical modelings as well. So that's great, and to have you get the input early on so you model the things that really make an impact out. And I'm really interested in the hydrogen hubs and, in, and be involved with the project in terms of doing the modelings as well. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you. So I know we only have a few minutes here. I think that the Chancellor, Paul Jeans, had a few comments that he wanted to make and a reflection uh, of tonight's dialogue. Good. 
Thank you very much, Janet. And, and uh, thanks also to Priscilla, to Morvan and to Kirsten. It was uh, lovely to have your involvement and your perspective. But, but I think it, more importantly than anything, to gauge your enthusiasm. I mean, uh, it's a very interesting time we're, we're facing now. COVID uh, has fundamentally changed a number of things, but from a university perspective, it's really challenged the university business model. The idea that uh, there were enormous revenue streams from international students is something that's changed and may well be changed forever. Uh, I think there's also a recognition from government that Australia's self-sufficiency in many areas has to be re-examined. And as part of the combination of those two activities, the role of universities is being re-examined, uh, particularly in terms of universities' roles in economic and social development. And uh, I think tonight's been an outstanding example, not only of how a university can be more integrated with its stakeholders in the community, but, but how our university, which is quite unique given its, its presence in its uh, footprint, can have uh, a real impact on the future of the hunter. I mean, the hunter, to any Nova Castrian, is of enormous importance to, uh, uh, to New South Wales, more so than is generally understood. And I think the challenge for us in future is to make sure that we collectively play a role in ensuring that that future uh, uh, evolves into a, a continuing important future, a continuing important future in the future. Um, I think the other thing that was quite uh, evident tonight is that the university's business plan, uh, I'd like to suggest through great foresight, has anticipated some of the events and outcomes of the events more particularly that have taken place. So we're in a very good position to fast start. Uh, the second feature of tonight is the obvious uh, demonstration that cultural change is also taking place. Universities have got to be more responsive, got to be more agile, got to be more integrated with the community. And I think tonight with uh, Janet's presentation and our excellent panel, that's evident. Uh, on the question of the hydrogen economy in the future, I'll just put in a plug that we uh, uh, anticipate that we will be able to have Australia's chief scientist, Alan Finkel, uh, come to us for another co-badged presentation early next year. Uh, we'd hope to do that before the end of this year, but circumstances have not allowed it. So, Janet, to you and your panellists, congratulations. You've both informed us, uh, you know, caused us to be enthusiastic uh, and also whetted our appetite in a number of these areas. So well done. Thank you very much, Chancellor, and, and really thank you to all of our guests tonight and thank you to all of you for joining. We couldn't do it if we're not together in a partnership. This is why I'm here. This is what gets me up every morning and I'm looking to forward to some of the great things that we can do in the Hunter. Before we wrap up for this evening, I just wanted to let you know that the fifth and final lecture in this series will be held on the 24th of November. Just to let you know the title, it's gonna be titled, We Are Talking, The Black Lives Still Matter, Justice, Equity, and Education. And this panel, I hear is a fantastic panel, is going to be led by Nathan Towney, our PVC Indigenous Strategy and Leadership, who opened uh, and introduced Auntie O'Laurel for us today. And he's going to be bringing together a panel of local Aboriginal members of our community and, and university. I think the discussion will be focusing on the role that we all have in, in, in effecting positive changes for the Aboriginal peoples and communities. I know I'll be tuned in and I invite you to join us as well. Thank you and have a wonderful evening.
my best friend an apologetic text he says to come over well the whole damn town has been waiting for the 